and welcome to this week's Sunday Night Live, the automotive show where we talk about all things automotive. It has to do with the car business. We talk about it. We bring on the experts, people that live in the space to share with us some of the things that they're doing to contribute to what we do so that we can do it better. And tonight I'm, I'm very happy. I've got special guest Steve Apicella, and he's got a way that connects all of these loose pieces of the puzzle together, right? Imagine this big box of puzzle, which is essentially what our business is. There's a lot of pieces to it. And, um, you know, you reach into the box, you take out a piece, and now you look at the picture on the box. So now you have an idea as to where those pieces go based on the picture that you're looking at. Now, what if you didn't have that box and you just had those pieces? How much more difficult would it be to put the puzzle together if you didn't have the box that showed you what it looks like? Steve is going to talk to us tonight about the cover on the box. So without any further ado, Steve, welcome very much to the show. I want you to tell the folks here a little bit about you, how you got started, a little bit of background, what drives you, and then we'll just jump right into it. Sounds good. Hi, Paul. Uh, you know, I love that analogy before I get started here, because not only is it you don't have the picture on the box as a reference, but the picture keeps changing. Um, that's the reality that we live in, is that the, the pieces that we're, we're working with aren't always the same, and they evolve over time, whether that's the customer or the support community or the very environment that we work in, it's constantly changing. Um, so a little bit of background, uh, I've been in the automotive support community for 30 years. Uh, even at 50 years old, I still feel like a student uh, because that landscape that we all operate in and the, the pathways to success are always changing. And with all of my great experiences over these many years, it continues to teach me that the most important relationship in the auto sales industry is between the dealer and their customer. And that critical relationship that we're all there fighting for, um, whether in the dealership or part of the support community, is often undermined and cut short because of either lack of illumination at the, during the sales process about how the dealer can uniquely support the customer throughout their ownership journey together, or after the point of sale when it seems like, for many customers, the transaction's over. I bought the car. And the, the, the very critical nature of the success of a dealership relies on not just sales, but F&I and service and can be enhanced uh, if all those things are better connected. And that the dealer's unique ability to support their customer becomes more of the process so that the relationship doesn't abruptly end when the vehicle is sold. Uh, hold on a second. Hold on a second. Uh, Steve Chesson says there's an echo technical problem. Hmm, that's interesting because I just put up some sound pads today that uh, should have rectified any type of echo problem. Is anyone else hearing an echo problem? Uh, let us know. In the meantime, Ron Usher says hello. John Frazier, good evening, fellas. And uh, Steve, so let us know if, if, or anybody else, let us know if there's an echo beyond. Uh, Steve uh, hearing it. Justin says, hey, everyone, looking forward to this. Joseph Perez, good evening, all. Abel Aguirre, howdy, folks. And Steve says, tech problem. John Frazier says it went away. Hmm, sounds like a mob movie. Hey, what happened to him? Uh, he went away. <laughs> and Gene Gurley says, nope, no problem. Uh, so maybe that was just a, a gremlin in the wires or something. So my sincere apologies about that. But sorry to cut you off, Steve. So no, no, no. All good, all good. So our innovation is called Your Dealer Experience. Uh, it's a technological plug-in to take the, the, the pieces of the puzzle, as you eloquently put at the top of the show, and connect them together uh, so that the customer and the dealer has one unified pathway to stay connected and to uh, enrich the relationship in a way that's frictionless uh, and simple. Transparency, accessibility, all the things that we expect as consumers 
from all generations. You know, it's not a topic of uh, Gen Z or millennial. Yeah. Uh, I tell people all the time, you know, how often, Paul, is your head in your smartphone? Uh, all day long. The answer is constantly. And it's the same for everybody. And we expect these solutions and these relationships. You know, it's cliche. We talk about it all the time. Business yeah. is built on relationships. And strong, long-standing relationships are built on good communication. And if we're, missing, about communication. If we're missing that in some way, uh, then the relationships end. And, you know, again, it's a, it, a personal thing, but it works in business too. If you stop communicating to your wife or at least stop communicating in a way that they're receiving, the relationship is gone. And what we do is we take all these disconnected parts that we can talk about today and we unify it in one digital experience uh, to enhance that relationship. Oh, hold on a second. You know what? Is it just me or is it Steve or is it both? It's not reverb and now I just have a black screen. You know what I'm gonna do, Steve? I'm gonna exit out of the studio and then come back in. You wanna do the same thing? I can do the same thing, you bet. Okay, so I exited the studio, came back in. Hopefully that'll do it. And just waiting for uh, Steve to come back on. Huh, very strange. Uh, Steve should be on back on in just a second. John Frazier says, talking like I'm in a coffee can. Okay, um, how are we doing now? Is the problem... Did the problem go away or are we still experiencing it? If you guys can give me feedback on that, that would be good. Ron says, no problem here. Uh, all right, Gene says, you sound fine. Steve, you want to just say a couple things and see if, if it's on your end or my end? Mic check. <laughs> One, two. Can you guys hear me okay? And Gene, you're saying Gene said, sound fine. And then he said, oops, again. There it goes again. I don't know what's going on with StreamYard tonight. Can you hear me okay, Paul? I can hear you. Yeah, fine. I can hear you fine. Uh, let me just check one thing here. Hold on a second. Yeah. I'm going to call Gene just to check. You bet. Abel says it sounds good. Justin says it seems fine. John Frazier, hey, is it good now? Or is it still? Huh, Claudia says it's good. Abel says it's good. Justin says it's good. John Frazier says it's good. Uh, huh, yeah, please do. Thanks, thank you. Okay, I guess whatever it was, it seems to be uh, seems to be okay now. So okay. sorry about that. No, it's okay. Um, we've invested in crazy Wi-Fi, and my wife's show that we do on Monday nights. We we used to have issues with it, no longer since we got the new Wi-Fi. But every once in a while, there's not much you can do. I'm hardwired in here, so it's not even like I'm uh, I'm I'm relying on uh, Wi-Fi. So sorry about that. So. Um, that totally threw my train of thought off. No, that's okay. So that's you've okay. got, you connect all of the pieces together. Yeah, let me give you one example. And it's not limited to this, but one great example. So when we take a look at a, you know, the three financial work centers in a dealer, there's sales and there's F&I and there's service. And, you know, each one of those is critically important to the dealer's success. And the journey between those, although it should seem connected in many times, and we talk about this in the industry all the time, where the front end doesn't work with the back end and you know, everybody's disconnected. A service advisor finds out about what they're selling in the F&I office for the first time when a customer is standing in front of them requesting service from it. Uh, that kind of disconnection is palpable and is felt by the customer. 
And so, you know, I use Amazon. Everybody understands Amazon. Everybody understands the engagement of Amazon, that Amazon's unique experience isn't just about selling something one time. Amazon's real currency is about delivering the whole experience before and after the sale that keeps the customer coming back again and again and again. That's the benchmark. Yeah. That's what people expect. And when we talk about the auto sales industry, by its name, and I tell people to think about this, the auto sales industry's primary mission is unfortunately seen as the customer to sell them a car. That's the transaction that the customer seeks out these dealerships. They painstakingly find the right one. They spend tens of thousands of dollars there. They buy a car and our industry's retention is so horrible that most of those customers never come back again. And that's because again, this doctrine of the industry's there to sell the customer a car. When if we can focus more energy again on the experience, the ownership experience that the dealer can uniquely support, then we create an opportunity where the customer can embrace the dealer beyond that one-time transaction. Now you wanna know what's really interesting about that is that they cultivate uh, an experience so that you come back again and again. And that experience is not driven by price. It is no. not, it is driven by convenience and experience. And I'll give you a prime example of that. Um, it's no secret that I like chocolate, Dutch chocolate to be exact. So my local store that I used to drive an hour one way to, to go buy it, they closed up some time ago. So now I have to buy it on the internet. So I've been buying it on, from Amazon without even batting an eye. So I'm going through my desk and I'm cleaning out some stuff and I find a catalog from another Dutch store. And just for giggles, I, I go on their website and I go look. And the stuff that I'm buying on Amazon, I could buy from them for half the price, okay, half the price. But all this time, I've been buying it on Amazon without even batting an eye because it was convenient. Now, I'm not going to lie. I ordered a whole bunch of boxes last night from this Dutch store. <laughs> but the point being, to your point, it's they're selling the experience. So, yes, when they're in the box, there are so many different products that they have that they sell from different companies, right? Because this one's got a great deal on this product. That one's got a great deal on, um, you know, dealer branded, um, you know, maintenance package, you name it. There, there's this many items that, that they yeah, sell. In, in, yeah, in the F&I office. Yeah. So, yeah. You, know, to, you know, in the F&I office, there's 12 F&I product categories. And wow. sometimes, 12, 12. And sometimes a dealer has multiple vendors for one category. Like right. A technical vehicle service contract. They might have one that's for high mileage, and then they use somebody else for their reinsurance position or whatever. Yeah. But here's the thing. So, you know, with, with 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 different products in the FI office that are always powered by multiple administrators. Always. Every dealership wow. across the country. The dealership does that. It's tactically smart for them. As you mentioned, they choose the best products yeah. for the best providers. But here's the problem. How many different pathways exist as a direct result for the customer or service drive to engage those products when service is needed? And, how, and how many of those ways are <clears throat> modern, convenient, connected, desired? And this is, this is really an ugly part of our industry. So again, fundamentally, uh, think about this. These are primarily service contracts. That's what we call them, right? Yeah, VSC. The simplest definition of that is a contract for service. But yet the pathway to service with these service contracts, which are very valuable, they're valuable to the dealer from a profitability standpoint, and they actually are valuable to the customer. But the pathway to service is never disclosed at the point of sale. That's wow. right, that's right. If, if you did, if you really told the customer, here's the way it works, when you go to engage service, it's going to be like jumping through rings of fire. It's 1-800 numbers. It's it's, Fully phone numbers. Up. it's manual claim processing. Yeah. It's, it, you know, like we talked about before the show, Paul, it's, you know, think about the position we put these service advisors in. 
A customer intuitively comes back to the service drive, never read their service contract, never read their warranty. And most don't. They don't. They don't. They don't even they, know what they bought half the time. They show up at the service drive and say, hey, I bought my car here and I bought some service agreements here and they need service support. And today the service advisor has to say, what products did you buy from us? It's and the customer says, what are you talking about? I bought the car from you. Don't you guys know what you sold oh, me? You know, exactly. And this is, this is, it's a time suck for the service advisors. It's a poor experience. It does not inspire retention. And it shouldn't be that way. These valuable products can have currency to add retention to the dealer if they're done the right way. And they can keep the customer coming back again and again and again. But the experience of engaging them, like Amazon, is missing. So it's one of the unique things we do, one of many that we do, is we put all the third-party administrators and their F&I products into one engagement platform for the dealer and the consumer. So in that same exact environment where the customer comes in uninformed and they never read their service contract or warranty, the service advisor simply has to type in the customer's last name, scan the VIN barcode, and away we go, showing all the service contracts and warranties that the customer purchased in one engagement view. And you can process most of those claims in less than 60 seconds. Now stop for one minute there, because this bears repeating, okay? Every single time that I've stood in the service department, and a customer came in that had an issue with their car that thought they had a warranty, the process at the store level is, the service advisor has to stop what they're doing and go and find the F&I person. Now, depending on the layout of the dealership, if you're blessed to be in a newer store that's, a, that's had a remodel done recently, you're basically looking across the floor to see if anybody's in that office. But if you're in an older store, you're going up a flight of stairs, you're going across the, across the building where you can't see whether or not there's somebody there. And then when you get to the office, they're tied up. Service advisor, they're just looking at the clock. They've got a customer standing at the counter who is now frustrated because the trust right off the bat is gone. If I spent 40 grand with you guys, now I come in in my hour of need, you have no idea what you sold me. I'm standing there like a yutz while my service advisor's got to go across the building and look for the F&I person who most of the time is tied up with another customer. Is their priority the customer that's in front of them or is their priority the deal they sold nine months ago, a year ago, two years ago, right? And so, he, you know, I heard a service advisor say re recently and, and saying frustratingly so, do you know why most dealerships have world-class waiting rooms today? Because they need them. Right. You have to tell their customer, go have a seat and have a cup of coffee on us while we figure out what we sold you. Right. It's that's crazy. The, that's a problem. And again, I mentioned it earlier, but this happens every day. How many times does a service advisor, the position that they're put in, learn about products that are sold in the F&I office for the first time when a yeah. customer is standing in front of them requesting service from it? Yeah, that's unconscionable. That shouldn't never happen. And again, the, the prospect here, everything worked right. You right. sent the customer a service contract or a warranty and they came back. Yeah. And then the experience sucks. And it's downhill not, from there. It's not the service advisor's fault. They lack the mechanisms to be able to do that. But then here's one more thing, Paul, which is interesting. You know how much money a customer spends on these service contracts or warranties. And they Great never ran 2,500. It's a lot. Should a customer have access in 2020, almost 2021, to all their service contracts and warranties right on their smartphone? Yeah. So they'll be able to see the definition of them, understand how to engage service in them. And here's one more unique thing that we do. If for the first time in the industry, we can show the dealer service advisor and the customer, everything they purchase, even when they're powered by multiple administrators, then we can uniquely show them everything they didn't buy. Now think about this. Bingo. Huge, right? We do this inside of our app too. 
F&I Products, Critical Work Center for the dealer. We talk about PVR, per vehicle retail, and, and yeah. driving gross in the F&I department. But how many F&I products are really sold well after the point of sale? They're not. It almost doesn't, no it almost doesn't exist. Either it's a customer coming into the service drive for an oil change, and then you're trying to inspire them to buy a $2,000 service contract, which is totally disconnected, doesn't make sense. Or we hire these outside vendors that scrape the data from the DMS and then send mass emails out or mass postcards or phone solicitations that aren't personalized to the customer trying to inspire them to buy something that they didn't buy at the point of sale. This is totally broken, but think about when I say personalized. If I can show you everything you did buy exactly, right. even through multiple administrators, then I can personalize the transaction of here's everything you didn't buy, be able to learn, on it, uh, learn about it on your own terms and engage and buy it right inside the app. This transcends the currency that currently exists only at the point of sale and creates an organic second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth swing at the plate to right. continue that revenue transaction beyond the point of sale. Now, hold on. we got a couple of comments coming through here. Uh, look, so I think we're all good on the technology piece of it. Uh, Christopher Martell says, as a salesman, I would send out a quote of the quarter and... To keep in mind, 95% of people buy another car. Know what happens to the other 50 or the other 5%. Gene says, cool simplicity. And Terry says, can the app proactively engage the customer? Can the app proactively engage the customer? Yeah, so we have a thing called dealer messaging. This is another portion of it. Um, so dealer messaging solves what is another pain point. How does the dealer communicate with their customer after the point of sale today? So dealers have BDC departments. Yeah. There's sometimes outside vendors to be able to do this. But today, the primary mechanisms are phone solicitations, yeah. junk mail in the form of postal or email, or random text messages. And I say random because if the dealer's information isn't in the customer's phone book, it's a random text message. Junk. Customers are conditioned that these things, and again, I ask people to ask yourself, what do you do with a phone solicitation? What do you do with junk email? What do you do with junk text messages? Customers are conditioned that these are fraud, primarily, right? So what we yeah. do very differently is we use push notification and stylized messaging. We can uniquely do that because we've got the app on the customer's phone that we put there, by the way, Right. At the point of sale, so that there's a direct connection with the customer from the point of sale throughout their ownership <laughs> experience. A push notification, very different than phone solicitation, oh, yeah. is feels it again. Customers are conditioned that when you get a push notification, most people know what these are. You missed a phone call, that's a push notification. You missed a text message. It's a native it's notification. Native and and identified who it's coming from. It's a trusted source. Exactly. So when you click on that, it takes you into a stylized message that's able to show exactly what the dealer is trying to communicate. Now, think about this. After the point of sale, what should be the first thing the dealer communicates to their customer? Push notification and stylized message. Yeah. How about, thanks for buying a car from us. Welcome Sell to the, the family. Dream. Welcome to the family. We're yeah. looking forward to being on this journey with you. What about the next one being the service director saying, welcome to the family. Let me show you how our service department can uniquely support you on your journey, right? Relationship building from day one. Exactly. When should retention begin? It shouldn't begin 60 days later or 90 days later, 100. It should begin at the point of sale. Yeah. That's where you, you pour the foundation. To Terry's question, we even built in automated communications that can follow up about things like, it's time for your next oil change. Oh, hold on a second, are they time or miles or both? Both, depending on what data that we have in the system. Okay. So as the customer continues to interact with the dealer, we get updated information about where their mileage is at and obviously time from there. Yeah, so it learns the behavior. Exactly right. So now you have the ability to have automated messages. You can have messages that are created by the dealer that can be sent, not just in a broad broadcast, 
but yeah. they could be sent to segments of customers all the way down to individual customers. Okay. So you can really, again, personalize that. Go one step further. Paul, you've talked about this on your show a few times, which I really appreciate. So customers in your service drive, and you take the opportunity to see, are they due for tires? Correct. Do they need an alignment? You've talked about this brilliantly. Like there's there's revenue to be had right through the interaction, right on the service drive. But yeah. here's the question. Should that opportunity to enhance sales and enhance the relationship only exist when a customer standing in front of you? What if you had the opportunity to touch every customer and uniquely illuminate all the possibilities and all the support that the dealer can uniquely provide? And again, I think this is such a simple thing. There is nobody in the industry more uniquely qualified to support the customer on their ownership journey than the selling dealer where they bought their car. Absolutely. But Hold the- on a second. We've got a couple uh, questions coming in here. Let me just make sure. I, I don't want to fall behind. Uh, Ron says communication and teamwork and smiley face emoji. Michael Larkin says your house is your most valuable purchase. Your sec- your car is second. The industry as a whole needs to act like it, and they're not. Things are going to change. And Jeff Daniel says the lack of advisor slash service training with most F and I items makes the advisor's job so difficult. The customer knows they bought something and expect the advisor to know, and they don't. It's imperative to train service on what products you're selling. Absolutely, and Christine says, can you customize the client's requests? What do you mean by that, Christine? Oh, like pushing to more than one email slash text. Probably multiple notifications? Yeah, so we we support email, we support text messaging, but that primary communication, that push notification is what creates that organic natural trust. connection, the trust, right? Yeah, there's nothing like there's nothing like push notifications because you're assumed it's a, you know, it's like a family member calling in as opposed to some random number that you don't know. That, that, that's huge. That, so so oh. one more piece to this, again, the, the service advisor interaction, which was commented on a few times there. Yeah. If you walk into a, a service drive and talk to a service advisor and say, as again, as an industry professional, and say, how do you feel about the interaction between you and the various third party administrators that, that support your dealership? You're likely to hear profanity. Yeah. Because it's such a bad relationship. But the truth is, it's not the fault of the FI administrator and it's not the fault of the service advisor, it's the lack of a process. The process is completely missing. And think about this. I mean, again, this is about the transaction. Should a dealer, as part of the transaction to sell F&I products, which are critically important to their their gross. To their survival. Huge, right? But should that transaction mean giving away the relationship? Or should it mean giving away to a bad experience? Imagine this. And for most of our industry, most of the F&I industry and the third-party administrators, they all have their own process. They have, and primarily it's a 1-800 number. The, mo- the craziest thing that exists in our industry right now is most, and again, they're super valuable. I, don't, I wanna keep underscoring this. The agents that represent them, the products they provide, the services and the revenue opportunity that they create, f and administrators are immensely valuable. But here's the thing. We can't just be selling products just like we can't just be selling cars. Right. These are service contracts and the experience that comes with engaging in the service should be world class. But more importantly, you shouldn't have to go deal with somebody you've never <laughs> met, never talked to before or don't know who they are. The customer should always stay at home with the dealer. Always. It should now, be here's- part of the transaction that if you need to make a claim, you got to call some company in Atlanta, Georgia, you've never heard of before to file a claim. That's a ridiculous premise because a dealer's relationship is with their customer. The customer isn't looking to do business with somebody they've never met before. That's a now, here's problem. the great thing. Yeah. So <clears throat> the cycle is one where currently dealers spend about $630 per retail unit to bring the customer in, to sell them a car. And then most of that stuff is just cast aside Let's be honest, right? We spend 95% or more of our budget and marketing on new customer acquisition or bringing customers in the door 
to buy cars. But we don't we don't nurture the relationship from there. A lot of us, honestly. Yep. So how cool is it? Because it's a lot easier to retain what you have than it is to go out and buy new ones. So now with the relationship starting right off the bat, with the push notifications, the welcome, right? The, the selling the green, if you will. Yep. You're contacting them through a trusted source, a push notification, which is just like when you plug your iPhone in and it asks, is this a trusted device? Yes. Yep. Right? You, but you don't have to answer that every time because you've set it up that way. So the customer knows from minute one, wow, I just left there and these people, they care. They're not asking me to come back and buy anything else. They actually care enough to want to introduce the team to us, to welcome us to the store. So that's the feel good right off the bat. You're already in, feeling a high because you just bought something, right? It's like, oh, wait till my neighbor see, my friend see my new car. But now you've got a relationship building starting right off the bat that you feel really good about. And then, I don't know, a month later or whatever the time frame is that, that you, you discuss or you set up, now you get these regular communications through push notifications. Again, trusted source. you got a family member calling you. Hey, how you doing? It's like when you call your mom or your dad. You know, they're older. They're living by themselves. They're, there's not a lot going on for them. But when they get that call, they feel really good because it shows that you care. So now, to your point earlier about the educating the customer on the things not only that they bought but that they didn't buy, now, because, look, we want to do everything that we can do right here from our phones. It's just the way we are today. Life is busy. We want to do things on our terms when it's convenient for us. And we want, we want to make the decision based on the information that we have. We're not dumb people. So if you give us the information, you present it in an intelligent manner, then we'll be happy to make those decisions. So the piece about letting them know what they didn't buy and regular communications. Now, are there videos tied to that as well? Yeah, and that's driven by the third party administrators. So their assets are there about full disclosure. What is this agreement? What does it do? What does it include, yeah. not include, the videos, et cetera. Yeah. But think about this too, Paul, because you know, this is again a, a very important thing. <clears throat> Having gone through as a consumer, like everybody on this call has done, not only are we industry experts, but we're also consumers. We've gone through car buying processes. When you're in the F&I environment, think about how this sequence goes. So you, you work through the process over days or weeks or months to painstakingly choose a dealership and, and select the car. And then you go through the interaction of buying a car. Yeah. And then suddenly you're in this F&I environment where you're introduced to a menu of products, right? It's another decision you gotta make. If you saw how, and again, if you understand how condensed this presentation is in this menu, a dealership's got seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 products. How well can they really disclose all 10, 11, 12 products to the customer, right? First of all, they're meeting that person most of the time for the first time after having gone through a process. Right. So they're meeting a new face right off the bat. It's not like every F&I manager comes out to the desk and meets the customer. It just doesn't happen. It doesn't. So new customer, new management in the store. Guard is up because you know you're going to be sold something. Yep. And you got 45 minutes to do it. And of the of the 10 pieces of of products, maybe they should, maybe they remain a week for three of them. Four at best. And here's the money on the table, right? I get it in the industry. It's all about earning money. It's all about doing the right things to maximize our earning potential. But here's the, here's the money on the table. How many of the products that were on the menu that weren't fully disclosed or not touched at all, if the customer were properly informed and understood what they really represented, how many times would they buy those products? But here's the problem. F&I sales today is limited to the sale of the car. So after the point of sale, if you're able to learn about these products on your own terms, right. identify the need and fulfill it, but even one step further. So let's say you show up at, you know, one of the great people that are on the call and you show up on their service drive and they have this service support mechanism when they're trying to get service and they have this delightful experience. Like, wow, this dealership is great. And what they sold me, that really worked. 
And then when they start looking at those additional products, how much more likely are they to buy them? Like, hey, they good. Work, yeah. right? Yeah. Exactly. So that's part of the automation that Terry was talking about earlier, too, is not only can it be time based upon time and miles, but it also can be followed up automatically after they've had an interaction with a claim. Like, OK, that worked great. That yeah. was a great experience. How would you like to further enhance your experience throughout you the go. journey? It's another thing. But right now, today, if products are not sold, F&I products at the point of sale, they're probably never sold again. Correct. And that's a huge, massive missed opportunity. But for me, this is not only about creating the revenue, but creating the associated experience with it. So when a customer goes to use it, they're delighted by what they purchase and not frustrated by it. Yeah, no, because, you know, I've always said this, and I learned this a long, long time ago in the aftermarket. The number one thing you focus on is the relationship. And if you build and develop the relationship, then everything else will fall into place. Now, we've got a couple of comments coming in here. Jeff Daniels says communication. Absolutely. That is number one. Definitely way ahead of whatever's in second place. Michael Landis says, hello, everyone. Sorry I'm late. No problem, Michael. I'm glad you're here. Better late than never. And you can always catch the front half on the replay. Tommy Esposito, my Goomba says, as always, good stuff here on Sunday night. Thanks. No, thank you, Tommy. I appreciate you checking in. So let's go to a quick message here because we have the technology. It's a message from my friend, Ed Roberts. Hello, I'm Ed Roberts, Fixed Operations Director here at Bozard Ford Lincoln. How many times a day do you have someone asking you if you have a minute? When it's my staff, I have all the time in the world. Unfortunately, most of the time, it's a vendor telling me they have the silver bullet and they want a minute of my time to sell it to me. We all know they're going to take up a lot more than a minute. They're going to take up 30 to 45 minutes and put a hard sell on me trying to sell their product, whether it really benefits my business or not. I would like for them to do research on my business and truly bring something to me of value, but more times than not, they're just looking for a close. I was speaking with my friend Paul Meyer, and he told me about DillerVendorMatch.com. On DillerVendorMatch.com, there is a plethora of vendors from the front side of the business to the back side of the business and everything in between. Now you can find vendors on your terms, find what works for you, and then set up an appointment for them to come out and put together a presentation that is fitting to your business. Thank you, Ed. Very, very good. And again, I, you know, I love that. The Again, it's an evolution, not unlike what we're talking about here is we know what the desired result is, and that is to make the connection and to gain yeah. the account or to gain the customer, sell them more. But the pathway that we do it, that matters. And you know right. how, we, how we pursue it. And I, you know, I want to mention one more thing just as I cross my, my mind here is digital engagement is something that is critically important, but how many pathways, if a customer is going to engage digitally at all, how many right. pathways is the reality? The reality between a dealer and a customer is one. Correct. Customers are not going to engage in multiple pathways. And that's part of what our mission is, is that when you look again at these very valuable agents and very valuable third-party administrators, critical to the industry, if a single administrator puts energy behind, hey, I have my own app, no matter how good that app is, its Achilles heel will forever be it's one more divergent process. It's, it, it just doesn't work. And the industry has figured this out at some points. Let's talk about like menu software that exists out there. Menu software in the F&I office exists to unify the presentation. Correct. So that you're not presenting one product at a time or one vendor at a time. You're presenting a whole level of coverage at a time so it's more easy and more palatable for the customer. But what happens after the point of sale? It's all lost again. Correct. We have all these individual divergent things that is not a good experience for the customer. And even worse, it's not a good experience for the dealer trying to support their customer and further enrich that relationship. It's broken. Now, and to put this into, into dealer terms, where a dealer can fully appreciate and understand this, is when they're looking at products, let's say, okay, they're always concerned about what's the integration. Because the last thing even a dealer wants is yet another login, another set of login credentials. 
So imagine being a customer. Customers don't want additional logins either. They want one, just like the dealer does. One throat to choke. Exactly. So another, while we still have a little bit of time here, here's another profound thing to think of. Going back to what I said in the beginning about, is our mission to sell a car or is it to earn a customer? Now, again, I understand it's so important to sell a car, but what are we leaving behind if we're not earning the customer? So right. think about the transformation that's happened in the last year driven by the pandemic. Huge. And, and, and what's happened at the dealers from a retailing standpoint. Almost every dealer today is adopting some version of what's called digital retailing. Yeah. How can you start the process, continue the process, try to take away the pain points that exist in a dealership by engaging digitally? Again, that's brilliant, super brilliant. But here's the problem. Digital retailing's digital experience abruptly ends at the point of sale. It further contributes to the notion that that's it. The transaction's over. Right. I went through the digital retailing platform. I bought the car and have a nice day. And, and that's I, really the beginning, not the end. And it's just the beginning. I went through a car buying process myself not too long ago. And every time I go through one of these, I never disclose, hey, I'm in the industry. I'm just a customer because I want to see how the dealer goes through the process, how they treat me. After I purchased the vehicle, the only communications I got from the dealer was reminding me to fill out the survey. Right. The, the generic letter that's signed by the receptionist at the front desk that goes out from the CRM. That's it. You know, that, that's it. And again, it does feel like, again, it's, it, it's where we need to evolve. Yeah. It does feel like, okay, that's it. Like transactions over and the rest I figure out on my own. Yeah, the lights just came on. We're uh, we're shut off. We're uh, ushered out the door. Exactly, exactly. And again, there's so much more, and guys. I, I want to honor this because you know, Paul, you and I talked about this before. I am an expert at customer experience. I have been in the industry for a long time, but I am a student. You know, there's a lot of things that dealers do great, and there's a lot of people in the dealerships that really care about what they do, and yeah. the poor community, which is massive. Some of the people that you have on your call right now, um, critical to the dealer's success, right? And they do a lot of things well. But what we have to start understanding is how does our contribution impact the relationship between the dealer and the customer? And if we're adding one more process, if we're creating brand dilution because of our interactions and, and how archaic they may be, if we're not fulfilling the life cycle between the dealer and the customer, then we're part of the problem and not part of the solution. And this Bingo. is what we must all do to further help our industry evolve. Everybody wants to make more money, but we have to earn it by transforming the way that we make that connection. And the focus on the customer, because every you know when you focus on the money, when you see them as dollar bills, it doesn't work. Now we got a few comments coming in here. Let's get uh, caught up on these. Joe Brawler, welcome. Says upsell opportunity is going to be golden when the service department are regularly trained and spiffed on these products. Yeah, give them an incentive. No doubt. No and doubt. Joe says echo on LinkedIn, but not Facebook. Robert says there's no echo. And Terry says customer service is a transactional based Customer experience is relational, a relationship based. Brilliant. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, Terry knows that really well. He's good at it. Yeah. Uh, Lou, the coffee guy, car guy coffee. So solve the transportation problem. We make friends in the process. Man, that is so true. Most of my friends, some of my best friends today, I met on both sides of the desk today. People that I, I can pick up the phone and call at two in the morning are car people. Exactly. And Robert says, there's a little underwater effect on your end, Paul. More prevalent if I listen in a cheap headset, which I got in New York tour bus. <laughs> <laughs> Ron Usher says, trust first. Yeah, no, this is great, great stuff here. You know, technology has evolved so much, you know, over the last few years much last the last 10, last 10 years. And all of the things that, that customers have been screaming for for so many years, now we actually have the ability 
to implement. I mean, the, the tool that you're talking about, it's huge. I've never seen it. So I've you never know, seen these it. These core tenets of simplicity, transparency, accessibility, but but the core tenant, really the core tenant of it's the it's the dealer's customer and should always be their relationship. That at no point in the transaction should we be giving it away to somebody else. And there should be this, this ability to easily and intuitively connect. Again, our YDE, your dealer experience solution, is about a dealer branded environment that connects all the disconnected pieces behind the scenes so that the dealer and customer can have this really natural engagement process throughout their ownership experience. And it doesn't matter, you know, again, Paul, as we were mentioning, this time of year, easily broadcast out and personalize, it's time for your snow tires, or, you know, what, and the unique ability for us to have the right equipment and have the right knowledge to take care of your vehicle. This is really important. And then inside that notification, it's not static, it's dynamic. We're inside that notification you get the link that takes you right back to the service drive scheduler so the customer can get it done. Yeah. Connect it because that's what they're looking for. They don't want to then have to figure out, okay, how do I do it? Click right. to schedule your service now. And Bam. you stay at home with the dealer. Yep. Now, I want to I want to highlight Steve's comment here because this is freaking brilliant. And I've been preaching this for years and years and years. Steve says, why is the assumption cast in stone that service comes after sales? Why not start with a conquest basic service first? Steve, you get the Cupid doll tonight That's because cool. that is really brilliant. You think, think about it. A dealership on average across the country sells 100 cars on average. Not, maybe not in the last month or two. These are different times. And nothing lasts forever, so don't get too comfortable. But on average, over time, 100 cars a month is what a dealer sells over all different kinds of dealerships. They service, on the other hand, I don't know, anywhere from 1,500 to 3,000 or more, depending on the size of the, size of the store. That's, a, that's quite a differential in the ratio. Now, of that 1,500 to 3,000, Conservatively, half of those did not buy the car at the dealership. They did not. But yet, they come to the dealership. Think about it. When you're going in for a service purchase, it's not, yay, I got to spend 500 bucks on my car today, and it's not going to be any different than it was yesterday. It's still the same old car. It's not a happy purchase. It's a, it's a required purchase. But they trust you enough to come to you, even if they didn't buy the car from you, they trust you enough to come spend their money, put their faith in you and your ability, and trust you to do right by them to service their car. You know, the, the dedicated professionals that are on this call understand that every single touch point matters. Every, every. single one, right? Yeah. And and that the, you know, I, I just talked about I had a ownership experience or car buying experience that I just went through. I also had, my wife has a Ford Expedition. The light comes on, it's time for service. Yeah. So I call in and they're like, hey, we'll do that through our quick lane. I'm like, hey, can I schedule an appointment to make sure I can get out in and out efficiently? I said, no problem. So I set the time for 1230. It happens to be right down the street from my office, pretty convenient. Yeah. Um, I pull in there right on time at 1230. I ask, hey, you guys running on schedule or running on schedule? How long do you think you'll have it for? And this is for an oil change. Uh, air filter, cabin air filter, just the basic stuff, maintenance. And they're like, you know, it shouldn't be more than an hour. Um, two and a half hours later, my car was still sitting outside and hadn't been pulled in yet. And nobody talked to me about it. Now, because I'm a busy guy, I'm on the phone and I, you know, I'm, I I'm hear you. productive, right? Like we all do. Welcome to my world. But, but no communication and no explanation until I walk in and say, Hey, what's going on? They're like, hey, we're just really backed up. You know, we're going to get to it as soon as we can. This is such an easy thing that not everything goes perfectly. Even in the world of technology or in the world of engagement with F and I products or whatever, not everything goes perfectly. But you got to own it, you know, and you got to you, you got to navigate it 
so that the customer knows that, hey, I understand this is a pain point and we're working hard to resolve it for you. Customers appreciate that. Right. As opposed to just being abandoned. And yeah. the process in general is we're abandoning our customers a lot of times when we're focused on just selling a car. And then after that point, the relationship just seems to go away in many cases because that to the customer seems like it was the end of the transaction. Right, mm -hmm. it's the beginning. It's just the beginning, yeah. So Steve, that is brilliant, I love it. Because like I said, I've been preaching that for years. Great comment. Christine says, single platform is ideal. <clears throat> Absolutely, it's the same reason that the dealers don't want uh, multiple logins uh, for their systems. Michael Larkin, the interesting part about the car industry is that everyone is doing different. Does what I have match what their needs are now? If not, my add value as a vendor is the ability to say, I know a guy. That gave me another bite at the apple. Absolutely. Brendan Santiago, service pays the bills. Yeah, it sure does. More so today than ever before. You know, um, not again, the, the last couple of months or so is, is not typical and is not normal. But you know, there are, there are a number of front ends that don't make money. True. I mean, think about that. You know, inventory that, um, that sat for long periods of time. You know, you sell a car, you think you made two grand. Not when you take your carrying costs out of the equation, not when you take the battery you had to replace out of the equation or the dings or dents that you had to do because the car sat there so long, you know? So yeah, no, it's... You know, the currency, you know, they, they, <laughs> I honor the professionals that are on this call. I honor the professionals that are in our industry. The, the currency of a dealer isn't their ability to sell a car. That's a commodity. You know, the currency of a service drive isn't their ability to provide service. That's why there's a room full of mechanics. Right. It's the process and the manner in which they deliver that and they support it and the ex associated experience that comes along with it. That's everything. People are willing to pay more money for a better experience, right? Everybody is. Yes. Right. And <laughs> the truth is the more we allow the industry to be commoditized, whether that's on the front end, in f &I, or in service, when it's just about lowest price wins, we all lose. Including the customer. Including the customer. That we have to elevate our game in order to provide an enhanced experience. And again, I'm one part that does that, which is to unify the experience, to bring it all together, to make it to support our valued service advisors, to make sure they're empowered to support their customers in a way that provides a great experience, to put the power of connection to the dealer in the customer's hands and to be able to make that organic and connected is something that's a vacancy in our industry. But it's long overdue because this is what customers expect. And it's- I have one beat. Yep. What the hell took so long? <laughs> I'll tell you what, you know, so it's interesting, you know, Paul, you and I talked about this a little bit before, is that the support community has to embrace their unique identity. They have to embrace their unique proposition, but they have to understand how they fulfill the relationship between the dealer and their customer. And again, you mentioned it earlier, this is a Steve Jobism. You start with the customer experience and you work backwards. Yeah. That's where it's supposed to be at. And your ability yeah. to enhance the dealer's relationship then becomes the vendor's and the dealer's unique currency. That's what we have to do. And we, we can't, as an industry, we can't say, well, if I'm in the same platform as one of my competitors, then that's a liability. No, the liability is when you create a divergent pathway that fails to connect the dealer and the customer. That's the liability. And as our industry has evolved, we've got great champions that are leveraging our platform, growing every day. You know, I love talking about the claim side of it because we enhance that so much. Yeah. Last year we did 1.6 million claims, which I'm really proud of on our platform. This year we have <laughs> 1.6 million claims the first week in June. It's wow. massively accelerated. 
Wow. Because it solves such a massive pain point in our industry and pays attention to that most important relationship between the dealer and the customer. That, I mean, that just blows me away. I've been in this business for over four decades and never have I seen anything as connected as that. It's, you know, again, I'm proud of it. Uh, I'm, I'm mostly proud of the people who have adopted it as quickly as they've adopted it. Um, and we're, we are focused on it. Again, at the end of the day, it is about making money, but it's about earning that right. And provide that's you know what one more thing, Paul, to take away some of the, the mystery for those who may be on the call. Yeah. I'm not asking the dealer to change their F and I products. I'm not asking the dealer to change their DMS platform. And I'm not asking the third party administrators to change their admin platform. That's what's so unique about this is we make all those connections behind the scenes. And we're filling something, we're not replacing something existent other than analog process and disconnection. You're just tying it all together. You're tying it all together <clears throat> so that it enhances the dealer. So this isn't a proposition to abandon everything you're doing, no. Because they're reluctant to make change. Ex exactly, exactly. Wow, and you know, you said something before too about uh, you know their competition and the guy down the street or the gal down the street. You know, I look at competition a whole lot differently. Competition is opportunity. You never worry about the competition because the only person you need to worry about is the guy that's in your head. It's, you know, we talk that's about it. It over and over and over again, you know, a, a dealer's, an agent's, a third-party administrator's greatest adversary is <sighs> usually themselves. Yeah. It's conventional thinking. It's this is the way business has always been done. Those, that's such a dangerous place to be when the customer, the industry, what, what is currency and are you delivering it? That's constantly changing. It's like what I said at the top of the show. Yeah. I feel like I'm a student continuing to learn, looking at the industry, not from the C-suite, but from in the trenches. And you know, how does this work? How does this dance work between a dealer and customer? What are the pain points and how can we transcend it to turning into a unique opportunity to strengthen a relationship? And that's where the technology helps dramatically is that you connect all those disconnected parts, the pain points behind the scenes so you have one enriched experience between the dealer and the customer. Long, and long overdue. And here's the beauty, the beauty of it all, right? Customers only care about what's in it for them. And that whether, the, whether your customer is the dealer or whether your customer is the end user of the product, they only care about what's in it for them. And the fear happens and the apprehension happens when they don't know what the next steps are. So how cool is it when you're sitting in the box and you're so excited because you bought a new car finally, that old rat box that you traded in that, that you've been wanting to get rid of for the last five years, but for whatever reason, haven't been able to. Now you're finally treating yourself. You've, you've gotten what you wanted. And now you have these folks laying out for you what your ownership experience is going to be going forward for the next 11.3 or 11.5 years of ownership. And the, the tooling that you're giving them right on their phone where everybody lives today, where they can interact with the dealership. We care about you. And because we care about you, we're going to communicate with you through push notifications. So you know, we're not just some outside agency trying to muscle in on, on, your, on your wallet. We care about you. And we're gonna show you that in our very first communications, selling the green, before you even need to spend any money with us. Imagine, you're gonna see that we can. Just in that first step, the transformation that occurred, Dude. when you're now saying to the customer, in any of these products that you may purchase, there's one pathway to service through us. Go to our website. All roads, all roads lead pathway, to Rome. Or come into our world-class service drive where we're ready to take care of you. Imagine how that inspires confidence. Imagine how that creates opportunity to sell more products, 
Incredible. You know, it's incredible, you know. But again, yeah. what you're not saying is, and this is a great experience provided by somebody else. This is a great experience powered by us. Yes, I'm your really dealer. I, what? One more interesting thing before we run out of time. And this is again something that must evolve in our industry. So private labeling has been something that's been around forever, right? Yeah. Where the ability where I put my stamp on the brochure. Yeah. Some of the big manufacturers like BMW or Mercedes Benz private label all their F and I products. Yeah. We know in the industry that these products are powered by multiple third party administrators. Guaranteed. Think about what, think about what happens when I buy my BMW M5. And the, the guy in the finance office says, let me tell you about the BMW road hazard wheel and tire product. You know, it's BMW, it's it's authentic. And then I go into my ownership experience and I go to use it and it's not BMW at all. It's some third party administrator I've never heard of before. Again, put yourself in the shoes of the customer. What does that feel like? That feels like bait and switch. Like you sold me BMW, but you delivered me something else. And that's the uh, uh, what makes it authentic about your dealer experience. It's not my experience. Right. It's your experience. And that's the only experience they care about. The Their experience you care about. And you can deliver it when the rubber hits the road. That it's not just a sales pitch. You can actually do it. Uh, Jeff Daniel says, booming in service, absorption and retention, variable needs products to help since the playing field for them is stacked by most OEM earnings. Robert Sebastian says, we are our own most dangerous competitor. Yeah, no joke. No doubt. Robert says, if we focus on servicing the customers, we don't have to worry about the competition. I say that all the time. You know, people ask me, hey, um, am I the only one on your platform that does this? Well, let me ask you, if you had 10 choices or you had one, what represents better value for you? Well, for me, it would be the 10. Exactly. So don't worry about the other nine. If you're better than the other nine, the other nine don't even exist. All the other nine do is they make they make you the reason to be number one. Exactly. Christine says, keeping a consistent level of service is key. I left a shop I used since 1994, thus over ownership of several cars not because they changed the premium for convenience. No, not because they charged the premium for convenience and very seasoned techs, but because, <clears throat> oops, but because they let me down and never called me post a screw up to make it right. Experience. You work forever to get a customer. Yeah, and I, yeah, I really appreciate that comment. Experience isn't a pitch. Experience is something you actually do and you deliver. Um, you know, you can't, you got to walk the talk with that for sure. Hold on, it's oh, battery. Hold on a second here. I have multiple devices going and the batteries don't always last long on all of them. Um, yeah, that's brilliant. Brilliant comment, Christine. I love that. Yep. And let's see, Robert Sebastian says, Christine, too bad they didn't make it right and promptly. That's just crazy. That somebody well, wouldn't do. Also, another good comment that stuff happens. I mean, <laughs> stuff happens. It doesn't always go perfectly, but right. you have an opportunity to make it right. Yeah, I mean, people appreciate that. Look, I screw up sometimes, and it's very easy to make an excuse. But I just say, look, you know what? I screwed up. I, ha I had somebody that you know fell through the cracks on an appointment. I apologize. Does it always work out? No, it doesn't. But you know what? I'm not going to lie about it. It just sometimes stuff happens. Yep. Uh, let's see here. What do we have? Ron Usher says, thank you, Paul, Stephen. Good show. Thank you, Ron. I appreciate your support every week. Christine says, Robert, it's literally was just a phone call that was required. 1994 to 2018. Now I'm gone. Michael Larkin says, congrats, gentlemen. Awesome show. Paul Machine. Hola, all. Hello, Paul. And he says, mute a phone. Oh, man. Well, that brings us to another, an end of yet another show. I want to thank everybody for being on. I hope this brought value. Steve, if you wouldn't mind, put your contact info in here because what you, 
what you unveiled here, my friend, uh, was some pretty heavy artillery. And I think that there might be a couple of people that might have a couple of questions for you. So please make sure you put that in there uh, so that people can reach you if they need to or when they want to. So with that, I want to thank you guys again. Uh, if you see value in the show, please share it in your automotive community. Because if we can help one person get better at what they do, it helps us all. So with that, we'll see you next week on Sunday Night Live. Thanks, Paul. Thank you, Steve.